Hi everyone, I think we'll, so we'll get started now. Um, we've got a two-part talk uh, that we're going to do today. Um, it's about JVMs across the data center. I'm going to start by talking about this from the platform uh, of site, and then John will switch across halfway, and John will talk about it from the, from the JVM side. <clears throat> so what I want to talk about today, as engineers, we very quickly realize as we go through our careers that complexity it just compounds on itself. Anytime you introduce complexity, it just grows and grows and grows, and things become much more complex. It compounds. One single decision can lead to a whole raft of other decisions where complexity just grows without bound. Now, maybe the engineer learns this because they write their own code, which becomes spaghetti code, or maybe they're given a, a big ball of mud that they have to maintain or perhaps extend themselves. Either way, this is complexity that we need to be very careful about and we need to manage when we are building systems. In particular, for a platform, it's very important because it's easy to get into a trap of adding too much complexity and drowning out to your platform. If you're dealing with customers, it's easy to add a feature for one customer that's not needed by a different customer, and that actually becomes complexity for those other customers. The other thing when you're building a platform is that it's very hard to remove things. Customers build against that platform. They rely on features. They even rely on bugs, perhaps, as well. So it's very hard to change. All of these things come together for me to say that when you're building a scalable platform, it's very, very important to ruthlessly manage any sort of complexity in that platform. I say scalable here, not because I'm talking about large scale necessarily, but anything where you want to scale it from where it is today to where it is sometime later in, in the future. That could be from one to n, or it could be from, from like one million to 10 million hosts or something like that, whatever number it is. You have to ask yourself, is this, is this functionality that I'm adding, is this going to mean the platform can't cope with doubling? Is it going to fall over and break? Is the tech debt going to cripple the team? Is the operational burden going to, going to cripple the team? What I'm going to talk about today is the success that we've had building a compute platform for stateless services at Twitter, how we've scaled that over the time. And in, in particular, I want to focus on just one thing, one, one part of that, how we've modeled failures and maintenance and how we work with our customers in doing that. Before I get into that, I just want to mention who I am. Um, so my name is Ian. I manage the, the compute platform team at Twitter. I joined uh, a couple of years ago, three, four years ago. I started working on the low-level sort of containerization in Mesos, which, which we use. But over, the, over those last sort of three years, I've really observed this platform go through several orders of magnitude in scaling. Uh, and that's been really instrumental, really interesting to watch. So I talked about scalable, but let's talk about the actual scale that we're at. When Twitter moved off the monolithic Rails architecture it had to start off with, we really embraced microservices. We really, really embraced microservices, in particular stateless microservices. So they're not really stateless. We just push the state somewhere else and we make that someone else's problem. And hopefully you attended Boaz's talk earlier today where he spoke about the complexities of uh, building stateful systems. But for us, we're going to restrict it to stateless. Now, we've got hundreds of teams running thousands of services on the platform. And on the left there, that's, um, that is a zip can trace of one of our core services and all of the other services that it depends on running on the platform. Now, what's, what's interesting is that we have a diverse workload. Um, we support not only Twitter.com, the product that you, that you all use, hopefully, but also the ads business that drives the company, as well as internal things like CI and everything else and a whole raft of other random features. Now what do all of these services run on? Well, we have tens of thousands of hosts running hundreds of thousands of containers. What do we use to orchestrate this and, and to manage it all? It's a, a platform that our team builds. Um, we use Apache Mesos and, and Apache Aurora, both of them open source projects. And we do all this, we obviously we rely on the open source community and we rely on other teams inside the company. But our team itself, we build this platform with only 10 engineers, roughly. Uh, a, a combination of software engineers and site reliability engineers. So how do we go about that? How do we achieve that scale? Well, it's not by letting people do whatever they want, and it's not by having a whole herd of cats that we're trying to do anything with. If we think about one example, say we wanted to update the operating system running across this cluster. If we just let people run on it and do whatever they wanted to, if we wanted to update it, we'd have to go and reach out to each individual customer and say, we're going to update this host. Can you please migrate your job off and run it somewhere else? 
when you're running hundreds of thousands of, of containers, tens of thousands of hosts, that doesn't, that's just not feasible. It's the very definition of trying to herd cats. So if that doesn't seem like a feasible way of doing it, let's look at how other people do it. How do public clouds deal with this problem? Now, they go to great, great lengths. They devote a huge engineering effort to try and hide this problem from their customers as much as possible. So things like transparently migrating your VM from one host to another without you even noticing. They'll even move all of, those TCP, all of the TCP connections behind you as well. A slight, possibly a slight performance degradation during the move, but they'll try and hide it from you. Or else they'll live patch the system underneath your VMs. All of these things can work most of the time, but they require considerable effort from the cloud provider. And they're not perfect. Sometimes they do have to notify you of upcoming maintenance events, and you have to migrate your VM, you have to restart it somewhere else. But also, they're not immune, they're not fundamentally immune to the fact that unexpected failures can occur. And so, as a user of these cloud providers, you need to architect your system to deal with failures, even if they put all this effort into trying to hide them from you. So I don't envy the cloud providers, they're in a difficult position. It's a very clear separation between the cloud provider and the customer. They can't they, they have to service their needs for all of the customers in their markets, and they can't drive change in each and every one of those customers. Inside Twitter, we think of things differently. So we try to come up with a cooperative model where there's a model of the platform that the users have to actually accept and buy into. There's a couple of key parts to this model. The first is that users have to architect for the instances of their service being rescheduled. I've got failures there. I've crossed it out because we don't want our users to think about failures. That's our responsibility as a platform. They also, it's not about restarts, because we can't guarantee that they will restart on the same host. And if we can't make that guarantee, then let's actually take it out of the picture. Let's, let's actually eliminate that sort of complexity. So the only thing we have is we say, we'll reschedule instances of your service to somewhere else in the cluster. Given that, what do we do as a platform? Well, we ensure that their system is up and running and it's healthy. I say healthy here, I don't say running, because we don't actually guarantee that all of the instances that make up your service are actually running. In fact, we don't even guarantee that at most N, where you choose the N, are running at the same time. We actually may create additional instances, say if there was some sort of network partition, to ensure that you have sufficient instances. So this is sort of, these are sort of subtleties, but these are important because this is how we model the platform and how we expect our users to architect their system against. So, architect for rescheduling, and we provide uh, the service where we run and make sure that the services are healthy. The way that I like to think of this is being, rather than having all these cats running around that we're trying to herd, we've actually got a whole bunch of sheep. They, to us, they all look the same. We can treat them the same. We can herd them. We can make them go through gates, around in circles. We can do whatever we need to do to keep the platform running for them. This is what I like to see all of our, all our containers doing. So today I'm going to talk about four different things that are key to the platform. The first is around deploy and how we make it really, really easy for our customers to deploy onto our platform. The second thing is around how we make it really easy for them to horizontally scale. And I'll, I'll talk about why that's so important as well. The third thing we'll talk about is what happens um, when there are failures. How do our users express their sensitivity to different types of failures? And fourth, we'll come back to the maintenance. How do we actually do an entire sort of reboot of the cluster? How do we update the kernel? So to describe a job, we have a DSL. We have, we have a domain-specific language where they describe the DSL. Most of the services running on Twitter's platform are actually on the JVM, either Scala or Java. And so the, the JVM team has helped to build a, a really nice um, language where they can describe their jobs. So here we say, I've got a JVM process running on Java 8, and these are the other arguments. The user takes that, they add in some resources, and they create a service by saying, take n copies of this JVM running with these resources, and then go and create jobs which run in, in different clusters. In this case, I want one instantiation of the service running in one zone, uh, US East, and the other one in New Zealand South. It's as simple as that, and then they can deploy this. This is all it takes to get a service running at some scale. What sort of scale is that? Well, in this case here, I think previously it was 20 or something, 10. Here, you can just edit that and say, I want 1,000 copies 
a, a thousand instances in my service. And then they just do an update of, of their deploy. Now, in this case, they're, they're not actually changing anything about the job apart from the number of instances. And so this will keep those first 10 or 20 running and then add the other 990 and start those up into the, into the cluster. So that's really easy to do. The reason why this is so important is that it's really beneficial for resiliency if you have more shards. If a shard fails, sorry, a shard is a term we use, if an instance fails, um, if you have n instances, one of those instances fail, then you need to shift that load across to the remaining instances. When n is large, you need to shift a small amount of load. It's a small incremental increase to the other instances that are running. So we really want to encourage our customers to move to large n. A thousand is typical, it's, it's, it's fine, or more. So what does it look like in terms of scaling? If we're trying to do this to get resiliency, how does it look like when we place these things? We, we have to be careful about that. In this graphic here, I'm trying to represent two racks of servers. Each rack has six servers. Each server has four slots to run containers. Um, they're fixed sized for simplicity. So say if we had a job that had 20 instances, the way we could schedule this could look something like that, where yellow are the instances for the service. In this case here, we could, in theory, put all of the instances onto one rack, but I've chosen to distribute them across two. But even though we distribute them across two racks, in this case, a single host going down can take down four of the instances of our service. That's four out of 20. We can do the math. What happens if we take out the entire left rack? Well, now we've taken out 75% of the instances for the service. That's not a great place to be, obviously. We've taken down most of the capacity of the service. And these can be failures that we can't plan for, of course. What's a different way of placing all those instances for that job? We can let the customer give us information about their sensitivity. If we're running 20 instances, we may choose to have a host limit of one. So we limit the placement so that only a single instance goes on, on a host. If that host goes away, that's only 5% that we've lost for the service. We can also give it a rack limit where we limit how many instances there are per rack, in this case five. So this already means that we still get a quarter of the capacity could be lost on a rack failure. So in real life, we actually bump up in by quite a lot. We have much more than 20 instances and we have a lot more than five racks to support that. But the idea is we distribute the instances across the entire cluster. So given all that, we've, talk, we've spoken about failures and how we've led our users express their, their sensitivity to different types of failures. Let's turn it around now and talk about, as a platform, how do we do maintenance on this without impacting our users? We actually have, to start off with, a similar concept to the rack limit. It's even called rack limit. But it's for us as a service, not for our customers and their services, but for us as a service running on the infrastructure in the data center. We have our own rack limit, which we set to one. What that actually says is that we're telling the other teams in infrastructure that we're okay if an entire rack just goes away. Well, this is really important because it means that other teams, say, for example, network engineering, if they want to do maintenance on a top of rack switch, they don't need to ask for our permission. They can just take the entire rack offline. It doesn't impact us and it doesn't impact our customers. This is great because we really unblock those other teams. It could be site ops where they need to take out a bad uh, disk or a bad DIM and replace it. They can just yank the machine, doesn't matter, everything's fine. Now we come to the, 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 the interesting point, back to, 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 to circle back to where we started. How do we do maintenance at the cluster scale? Now what we have for this is we have an SLO which states to our customers that we will keep at least 95% of the instances of your job up and running for at least 30 minutes. Healthy, sorry, not up and running. What this means is that if we want to do maintenance on a particular host, we'll drain off all of the containers that are running on that host. To do that drain, we'll look at the job, we'll look at the other activity that we've been doing across the cluster, and we'll wait until it's ready, until we can take that container off and reschedule it and run it somewhere else in the cluster. And we'll wait for it as long as we need to. Once we've done that, once we've drained off all of the containers that are running on that host, then we can take it offline, we can do our kernel update, we can reboot it, wait till it comes back online, maybe we can run Puppet again to make sure that it converges, and then it comes back into the cluster and it takes jobs again. This is a process that we can do at the cluster scale. And it means that our customers know how much impact we can potentially do to them. They can, they can design their system, they can architect it to tolerate 
up to 5% of their instances being offline for some period of time. Is this sufficient for us to actually operate at cluster scales that we have? The good answer is yes, in that we can roll an entire production cluster, tens of thousands of nodes, and do a kernel update in 20 to 30 hours with basically no manual intervention. We just start this rolling and it just goes through, does its thing, restarts all the instances, all the jobs and everything else. The reason why it's 20 to 30 and not 10 hours is because there's a, a couple of reasons. First of all, servers take a while to come back up. It may take 10 minutes for a server to boot after you've rebooted it. It may take several reboots. So that limited, this sort of limits your speed as well. The other thing is that each container, each, each, so each, each host may have you know, one, five, ten different containers running on it. And we have to wait till all of those SLOs are met before we can start migrating containers off it. And so there's a bit of gating there. If we had a whole lot of jobs that were all 20 instances, then it would be a bit slower. But most of the jobs are actually larger. Um, the other thing is that it depends on how much excess capacity you have in the cluster as well. The more you have, the faster you can move through. The key thing, though, to take away from this is that with this relationship with our customers, with this understanding with them that we can do maintenance, but we control how much we do, we can actually do this with zero impact on the customer. So if they appropriately, if they go, if they go wide enough, if they have enough um, instances, if they're scaled horizontally enough, if they configure their alerts correctly and everything else, then this doesn't cause an alert, doesn't cause a page, doesn't cause anything for our customers. In fact, we routinely do this without them even noticing. We take a cluster of 30,000 nodes and we roll it. This is great for us and it doesn't require intervention. We start it, we come back the next day, everything's updated. Now, I'm gonna wrap this up and then hand across to John, but I want to talk about um, the fact that this may sound easy because we're doing stateless services. Well, it's, 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 it's not easy, but I will give it to you that it is easier than doing stateful services. Actually, it's easier than doing non-stateless. It doesn't have to be stateful. It could also be non-stateless. What I'm saying there is that we actually have some customers running our platform that uh, are large in-memory caches. And so they don't actually persist any state to disk. So they're not stateful in that sense. But they're important caches that we can't take down because it may take a week or two to actually warm those caches up. So this is something where you can't just take down an instance, wait 30 minutes, take down the next one and the next one and the next one. That would actually destroy the caches and take down the entire service. These are types of things which are sort of in the middle. We also have stateful services that we'd like to support on the platform as well. Now you may argue that the platform as we designed is not applicable to these sorts of services. Well, I would counter that you can't get away from failures. And as soon as you start engineering and architecting for failures, then you can also work around how to do maintenance as well. You come back to the same thing. But I must acknowledge that we would have to work harder than what we're doing right now. So now, we just say that we will reschedule somewhere in the cluster. We may have to change that to say that we will restart you if at all possible. We, we can't guarantee that, of course, because the instance itself may go away. But it's a pretty important optimization for stateful services to be able to restart with your persistent storage. But of course, the application has to architect itself to account for unexpected failures. But it may be that it takes a couple of days to migrate, to, to, to actually rebuild a replica. In which case, maybe you actually want to try and restart in place and you're okay if it takes 12 hours to get restarted in place. That's the sort of thing that we have to be configurable. The next thing is maybe we have logical failure domains. So I spoke about hosts and about racks as being physical failure domains. There may be logical failure domains that the application can express. For example, this is one partition set, this is the other, other set. Those things, maybe we don't want all replicas under the same core switch, things like this. And then back to the maintenance policy, to the cache, and to the cache case. Maybe they want 95% for 12 hours. Perhaps this also can be configurable or could even be, it could even be delegated out to the customer themselves. Maybe they have the awareness of what their application, how the data is partitioned, how it is replicated. And we could say to them, we want to reboot these 100 hosts. How can we do it? And they tell us, and we go ahead and we do that action. So these are all things that we can do to extend this platform to also do more stateful type services as well. But the key thing I want to take away is that we made a very conscious decision early on in development of this platform to simplify it. 
we said if you want to come on the platform, you have to support this way of doing things. We have to have the flexibility to yank the plug on some fraction of your instances. You have to tolerate that. If you tolerate that, we make it really easy for you to scale and we keep your system up and healthy. So I'm going to pass this across to, uh, to John now, who's going to take the different view. So I took this from the platform. He's going to look at it from the customer, um, particularly from the JVM. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll save those to the end and we'll answer them together. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, my name is John Coombs, and I'm going to continue with part two of this talk, focusing on actually a user of the platform that Ian just talked about, and a little bit more about some of the problems that we might encounter basically because of the way the Twitter service works. I work on the Twitter VM team, and I'll be focusing on that layer kind of of the Twitter stack. Two issues that definitely come up, uh, or a number of issues come up, basically because of the way Twitter works, basically because we have scale, and we also have real-time or near real-time response goals. Um, say, for example, you're watching the debates and you're getting really frustrated. They're not talking about your favorite topic. Maybe that's the environment, policing, whatever. You tweet to your friend, hey, why aren't they talking about X? If that tweet shows up five minutes later after they've already asked, been asked and answered or more likely avoided answering a question on the topic, that's a little frustrating. Um, same thing can happen when you're dealing with live events like a sporting event, right? If you tweet something about it, say your team's about to score a touchdown, you're saying, I know they're going to do a shuffle pass to the right. They're, they're, they'll take the lead and um, game will be over. Well, if that tweet shows up 30 seconds later, after the play's already happened, you totally lose your I told you so moment. So I want to talk about some of the problems that we've encountered and some solutions that happen basically because of scale and real time. So First, I want to talk about what scale is. What, what am I talking about? Then I got three problems that we'll talk about, and hopefully we'll have time for some questions at the end. So what is scale at Twitter? We basically have to deal with hundreds of millions of tweets per day, um, more than 500 billion since 2006. And it's not just delivering the tweets. There's all kinds of other activities that go on in terms of indexing, storing, searching, being able to retrieve these tweets much later. Uh, there's also another kind of scale. Basically, Twitter is not a service, um, as Ian mentioned. It's many services, microservices, each with multiple instances, and anywhere from a few to a few thousand. Uh, so that's a lot to deal with. You don't want to have to manage things, as Ian said, individually when you've got to deal with a thousand of them. It's really a huge distributed system. And as you mentioned, we've got, you know, on the order of a thousand services, maybe you know, 100,000 service instances and some smaller factor of hardware to match. It's a lot to deal with. Some examples of Twitter services basically have your basic tweet service, user services to look things up, who, who log in, uh, timeline service to actually um, figure out what should be in the user's timeline, what should they, they see when they start up Twitter, and of course, stuff like ads. Um, they're deployed in Aurora Mesos, which makes it practical to deal with the number of instances that we have to deal with and also enables us to use our hardware resources efficiently. Um, the key that is relevant to me is that the vast majority of these services are written in Java or Scala. So they run on the JVM and they rely either directly or indirectly on the JDK. We also have some Python, a little bit of Ruby, which we've been moving away from, and even a little C++. But the bulk of our services depend on the JVM and JDK. So one problem that you see at scale is not so the most interesting, but support. Since Twitter relies on the JVM JDK, it's a critical part of our infrastructure. How do we deal with that? We need support in several aspects. You need to be able to turn around bug fixes quickly, be able to diagnose them, get binaries out to the users. You also need some expertise. The JVM is not something that does the same thing every time. It actually is a lot of tuning involved, and the behavior of it is not always really predictable. Finally, you also actually need to work on the performance of the JVM itself. And it, at scale, it typically means removing bottlenecks. So who do you get to do the support? Vendor support can be expensive, and it actually can be priced per core. Um, scale up with the number of cores that we have, you know, tens of thousands of hosts, each one multi-core, that adds up quickly. 
The, also, the other thing is that performance requirements are actually different for a service or the services like Twitter. Typically can need, necessitate custom code. That's even more dollars if you want to try and get that from a vendor. So we actually took the approach of having our own JVN team. We maintain our own JDK distribution. Um, it's based on OpenJDK. We use it internally. It's not distributed external to Twitter. We actually support Linux and Mac. Those are the platforms we care about. We do releases fairly frequently, quite a bit more frequently than you might see from Oracle, about once per month. And we can do them much more frequently or quickly in the case of emergencies. Turn around a binary in a day or so if, if it's only going to be used by, say, one service before we can actually take a new JDK and farm it out to all of our services. We need to do more validation than that. But in, the, in, the, in a small case, we can actually turn around fixes very quickly. So we have a small team of engineers that build our own JDK. It's more responsive and less expensive, something that you don't typically see unless you're running at scale. A little bit on the background, OpenJDK is the open source Java SE implementation. Most of you know that. It's developed by Oracle plus the community, which includes Twitter, Google, Red Hat, many others. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily know that the binaries you get when you download from Oracle are not OpenJDK. Oracle adds extensions to OpenJDK and actually replaces some of the functionality. Most of this is done in the JVM, but also some in the Java libraries. In a similar vein, Twitter JDK takes the same approach. We take OpenJDK, add some to it, replace a little bit of functionality. The key message is Twitter JDK is not the same as OpenJDK and also not the same as Oral JD, or Oracle JDK. Um, some of the enhancements that we have in Twitter JDK include extended heap profiling. That allows you to see sort of where your ob uh, objects are migrating to as the GC moves them around as opposed to just being able to see a static view of your heap at a specific uh, point in time. We also have improved GC logging. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And we're working on a more general binary logging framework called Contrail that has, has a lot of advantages, not just for GC logging. There's a feature called intermediate gen generations for the G1 garbage collector. And that allows G1 in certain environments basically to better handle a different lifetime, object lifetime uh, pattern than is typically seen with most Java programs. They tend to exhibit sort of a bimodal pattern. We have lots of very short-lived objects and some long-lived objects and nothing in the middle. These intermediate generations help deal with those objects that fall into that middle range. Not long-lived, but not short-lived. And we have another, many other performance improvements and bug fixes. But one of the key things about that is that we try to keep the difference between OpenJDK and Twitter JDK small. We don't want to have to deal with larger and larger uh, set of differences between OpenJDK. We try to contribute the, upstream, the fixes upstream as much as possible. So probably the least interesting of our problems, but something that some people may find a little surprising is that we actually do our own JDK distribution. The next problem is something that we saw in production. We saw these strange and long pauses. Um, before we get into that, I want to look at the stack a little bit. Um, so you have your hardware, you have one operating system, you have multiple Mesos containers, each running a JVM for JVM-based services, and each running a service. The key thing here is that the services are different. And as Ian mentioned, for reliability, you don't necessarily want to schedule all of your instances of a service on the same box or even on the same rack or behind the same switch. One of those components goes down, your service is in trouble. You want to spread them out for reliability. This also gives us some flexibility in terms of scheduling um, services on the hardware. Because they have different resource requirements, we can mix and match those to get the best fit. So the first hints we saw of this were some very strange pauses. Some service noted occasional dips in the request per second that they were able to process. They also saw spikes in their 99 percentile response times. The strange thing, especially considering the Twitter environment, is he's having only on certain instances, which is unusual because the load is very uniform across the different instances at Twitter. The GC logs showed extremely long GC pauses, like 20x or even more the normal or average GC pause for that service. The, the weird thing was nothing else 
in the GC log looked unusual. There was no explanation for why this particular pause took so long. The typical culprits were ruled out. A promotion failure, basically when you run out of space um, copying data, and you have to do a full collection, collect the entire heap. That's something that the garbage collectors in the JVM try to avoid because it's expensive. Before we go into more detail, well, before I, we need some background before we continue on this. And JVM safe points are basically a technique used to keep the Java heap consistent so that nothing is modifying the heap except the JVM itself. The application threads aren't touching the objects. This is usually implemented, at least it is in hotspot JVM, by stopping all the Java threads. Threads in JNI native code can continue, continue ex executing, but as soon as they try and access the Java heap through the JNI layer, they will block at that point. The main use of this is for garbage collection, but there are a number of events in the JVM that can result in a safe point. The key idea is that you want these to be short. Basically, your application's not getting anything done, it's paused. And just to give you an idea, it's common to see uh, pauses at Twitter on the order of tens of milliseconds, maybe a few tens. It varies greatly by service and by load, but that's typical for a number of services. So here's an example, just distribution of safe points when these services were operating typically. You'll see they're not all the same length. They don't have the same duration. They're actually very two from the average, which is somewhere near the bottom line there, to two, three, even more times that average. But it's within a reasonable range. What we were seeing with these crazy long save points was something more like this, where the previous normal save points you can see is just a little bit of fuzz along the bottom of the screen there. And then you got these huge walls kind of sticking out, obvious outliers. There were no, we didn't have any good ideas as to what could be causing these. I mean, they seem to come out of the blue, kind of like a rogue wave, something totally unexpected that's way bigger than what you normally see. Well, after a key insight, uh, one of actually of many, a service owner noticed that there was a very IO intensive job running on a host uh, at the same time as these long pauses were seen. So one of his instances that was experiencing these crazy long pauses he correlated that with this IO intensive process running on the same host. We ended up discovering, and I'm simplifying it greatly, but after a pretty lengthy investigation, that the JVM does some IO during safe points, basically to do logging and other monitoring activities. It doesn't do much, it's just a few kilobytes. We write to the GC log, and we also update some shared memory counters, which can be read by other processes for monitoring purposes. But this I.O. was being blocked basically because the I.O. system was being saturated by this other job being scheduled on the host. So we looked at a few alternatives. One is potentially segregating these different types of jobs. It's a little tedious to go through and audit a thousand services or so to see which ones are going to be I.O. intensive and not. And the other thing is that not all of our services actually run in Mesos. Some run on what we call dedicated hardware so that they experience the same kind of problem, but not due to Mesos. So, it, so scheduling, changing Mesos scheduling wouldn't really help these other services. The second alternative is just turn off the I.O. And that way your save points should be shorter, they wouldn't be blocked, but you lose your monitoring capability. Clearly not what we want. So the, the solution that we decided upon was to actually make the I.O. during the save points asynchronous. Don't block, buffer it up, write it later. So in Twitter JDK, GC logging, which is something, a tool that we use all the time for any kind of detailed analysis of GC behavior, as well as JVM stat writes, which write to performance counters visible to other processes uh, that we also use for monitoring, are now both asynchronous by default. We're also working on a longer term project called Contrail. And this is asynchronous by design. From the ground up, it was built that way. So it also uses a binary format, which is very compact. And that's necessary for us because we want to monitor all of our JVMs across our data centers and you know, on the order of hundreds of thousands of instances. And that's a lot of data. It's got to be small. Um, you could say, well, compress the GC logs. But the problem with GC logs is they're an undocumented, unstable, unfriendly format. So we want something that's more reliable. 
Also, this facility is actually going to log not just GC information, but also information about chip compilation, about the runtime system itself. It, it will also able to capture stack traces. Say, for example, you have um, memory allocation, unusually large, happen to cause an out of memory error, or maybe it causes a full GC. You might want to know where in the code that happened. Well, we can actually capture that information with Contrail. So now on to my last problem, um, tuning. So we have a lot of services. Uh, each one has, say, a different allocation rate, distribution of object sizes or object lifetimes. They also have, and most importantly, different response time SLAs. So each of them typically needs to be tuned on, it own, on its own. The area that needs the most help with tuning is garbage collection. The out-of-the-box settings are reasonable for some applications, not really for most Twitter services, which basically have very strict latency requirements. The defaults typically don't apply well. Most Twitter services are stateless, as Ian mentioned. Um, basically, what that means, they have large amount of short-lived data, very little long-lived data that lives more than, say, a second or two. For, as one example, the simplest is that the default JVM heap that you get if you just run Java it reserves about two-thirds of the heap for long-lived data, which we have almost none of. So it just doesn't apply. And that's just the first layer of the onion of performance tuning that you have to go through to get the response and performance that we want. So we have to tune the JVM. And it's not exactly like my son trying to tune his ukulele. It's pretty complicated. Oops. So the JVM actually has hundreds of parameters that you can tune. They're not all performance-related but there are a lot of them, and many of them do affect performance. It's in scale, it's more like tuning something like an organ, way bigger than a handheld instrument. When you have these hundreds of parameters that you have to tune, and you go through a tuning process where you adjust some settings, you redeploy your service, capture some results, take a human to actually analyze the results, make some new suggestions, that takes a while. It's also, it's got to be iterative. It's just a slow process. It's time consuming. It's also not a science. Humans are not good at taking all of these variables and analyzing the effects of one at a time. We can't really, we also don't have the time to analyze each in isolation. We've got to make educated guesses and try several variables to repeat our experiments and get a result after only a few or in a reasonable amount of time. So the result is many services do cargo culting. So they actually copy the, the performance settings from a previous service and apply it to their new service, even though it's different, has different behavior, potentially different response time requirements. And code changes frequently on Twitter. And differences in code can change the way objects are allocated and makes the, makes the settings that you just hand tune obsolete. It's something that just doesn't scale. So our hypothesis is many services are actually not optimally tuned. They're reasonably tuned, but not optimally. So what do we want to do about that? We want to take this cycle where you kind of iteratively choose parameters, run, have somebody look at it, and get the human out of the loop. We actually want to come up with some kind of automated tuning assistant. Um, and how are we going to do that? Well, the technique that we and I say we, but it was really done by my colleague Ramki Ramakrishna and an intern that we had from Purdue over the weekend, over that summer, Zhang Kiao Lu. He works really fast. Uh, <laughs> um, is to apply Bayesian optimization. And this is a technique from machine learning. It's applicable to black box optimization, where you don't know what's going on inside the thing that you're testing. And it can actually learn the values of a potentially noisy cost function pretty efficiently, and it finds good answers in a reasonable amount of time. So in order to do this, we needed a cost function, basically a, a measure of performance that's a number. We also had to pick a set of tunable parameters. And there, we had just way too many to choose from. We chose a, a relatively small subset. And we also need to express constraints on those parameters. Those restraints are generally exposed and uh, in, imposed by the JVM. For example, the size of the young generation in your heap, the new size, can't be larger than the entire heap itself. So we have to be, have a way to express those. So this uh, tuning function actually doesn't pick, uh, pick values that don't make sense. So the cost function that they came up with was request per second 
divided by the GC cost, where GC cost is the amount of wall clock time you spent in GC, basically while your application is paused. And for parameters, there's too many to list here. We chose about 30. But that's pretty big search space, particularly if you were thinking about doing this on a human scale. Um, we ran this in a staging environment. This is sort of our first attempt at it, uh, which gets a fraction of the normal load, and the traffic is read-only, so it doesn't affect the real world of Twitter. Um, those experiments were run relatively quickly, less than an hour in duration. And after about 70 narration, iterations, we saw that things would converge. When we looked at the results, it was pretty impressive. Over 180% performance improvement. Now again, this is just a limited test and not something that we're using today in production, but it shows that there's real potential here. So there's some future work to be done in this area. The tests we did were basically on steady state data, not under load. And obviously, you want your service to perform well under load as well as in the normal case. Um, we also want to run longer experiments you know, in terms of days, not in terms of an hour or less. And we want to run experiments concurrently. And here is actually an area where, area where scale and Mesos really can help. Because we have so many instances, if we can dedicate just a few to running experiments, it won't really affect the overall uh, performance of the service, and yet we can get value da valuable data much more quickly. And obviously, we want to terminate experiments that are poor from the very beginning early. That's something that we don't do. We currently have to run them to the end. But I think this is all, uh, the initial results show that this is a promising approach and something that we're going to be pursuing in the future. So that's my last problem at scale. Um, now I'm going to open it up to questions, and both for Ian, if you have questions about Aurora, or myself, if you have questions about the VM. Question. Um, I guess over here. Yes, please. Uh, one question on Ian. Uh, so you guys run restartable batch jobs in your in your platform? Uh, well, we, we we do support cron jobs. Okay. If that's what you're asking. I guess I mean more like you know, uh, Apache, Spark, Hadoop, sort of those sort of. Uh, I'm just curious how you sort of deal with really long jobs where you can't be really sure of when you're going to be able to have that maintenance window because it may be a four-hour you know, batch job or twelve-hour. So the, the short answer is if the customer can work with that, okay. with it, then, then they can run it on the platform um, right now. So we, we do run things like Heron and other sort of streaming compute things as well. Um, we do things like rolling the entire cluster maybe once or twice per quarter. Not every day. It's not a daily occurrence. And so the actual, if you have a large number of instances, the actual number of times where your instance gets restarted or rescheduled is relatively low. And most of the time, they are resilient enough to deal with that. So. It, generally, it works fine. Yes, please. Um, so, uh, how often do you pick up a new version of the JDK in order to, to make it the Twitter version of the JDK? Do you try to stay as current uh, as possible? So, let me re repeat the question. It's how often do we pick up a new version of the upstream open JDK and incorporate it into Twitter JDK? It depends on which release we're talking about. We actually don't run bleeding edge releases in terms of the major release of the JDK. For example, we're running on JDK 8 right now. But whenever Oracle releases an update release, we pick that up very quickly, usually within a week or so. Incorporate that into Twitter JDK, and then start our release process where we get some builds and people some fortunate uh, or friendly volunteers actually test it with a few instances of their service to get feedback, and then eventually publish that so it's in use for all of production. So we stay on top of it pretty quickly. And do you ever run into uh, compatibility issues with your services um, between your version of JDK and what you think is the standard version? Or do all of your services have to develop on, um, on the Twitter JDK? All of our services run on Twitter JDK. That's what we support. Um, yes, here, please. So, uh, how does the, the continuous deployment works with 
any of the maintenance that you're going to do, the rolling maintenance you're going to do. For example, you, you're just going to take one rack down, basically. So here you guys have to coordinate in an automated or manual fashion with the deployment pipeline. So the way that we do we do the maintenance is that we talk to the scheduler, and so the scheduler is also aware of any updates that are going on to the jobs, and so it is factored into the into the time into the healthy time the jobs have been running. So you can do both of them concurrently, and they will just interact just fine. Yeah. Uh, that asynchronous GC walk—that's something that you guys publish that uh, publicly, or is it internal for now, or is it, is it something that we can tweak in the open data kit? Um, it's right now it's in internal only. Um, it's definitely something that we're looking at publishing. This is a big enough change that I'm not sure it would be accepted upstream, but we will try. We are in the process of trying to get it out there somehow, either upstreaming it into OpenJDK or potentially putting it out there on GitHub even. Start from okay. the left. <laughs> yeah. Usually it's the most common thing that we do is start by looking at uh, the JVM parameters and that sort of large scale behavior of the GC. In many cases, it's trying to figure out um, sort of what's the, the large scale behavior if they have the application may have a phase change and the object lifetime distribution changes. Um, it's stuff like that. So primarily we start looking at JVM parameters, but in a number of cases, we saw um, issues that basically couldn't be fixed or couldn't be fix, fixed without sort of tremendous effort in the JVM. And we've actually modified the JDK libraries to actually help deal with that. And these, can, these fixes have actually been contributed upstream in some cases. So it's a mix, but usually we start with the JVM. Sure, go ahead. I know you guys are founders of services. Uh, how do you start with, uh, choose basically the JVM size, so JMX parameters, how do you choose it? What parameters do you look at? Um, it really depends on what the service is doing. Most of them are basically stateless. So they have a lot of, um, and if they fit that model, we tend to size it with a very large young gen and a fairly small old gen. So that the young generations happen, for, uh, the young generation collections happen fairly infrequently and because the data doesn't survive, it's actually very easy to collect a large young generation. But it's based on what we know about the service and some input from the service owners. And I think we're out of time, so thank you very much and we'll be hanging around we'll outside around if you outside. have questions.